Good evening, ladies and gentle furs. Welcome to the South Africa podcast. You're uh, listening to uh, Ivic Wolf and my co-host Scratch. And tonight we have the uh, wonderful honor of having uh, Mr. Fred Patton um, on the uh, podcast with us. Uh, thank you, Fred, for joining us this evening. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. I feel honored to be invited. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Fred, if you'd, if you'd like, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself first. Um, you know, why possibly the furry fandom um, when you were, I think, was it 1967, if I'm not mistaken, that you began to start writing about furry literature? Exactly how did that start? Uh, well, I've, I've been a uh, science fiction fan since I was about nine years old. Uh, I've, uh, written several biographies that I've explained but that how I uh, when I was a child I read everything that was in my uh, around my house and that included my uh, mother's uh, uh, murder mysteries and uh, so on my father was a fan of uh, Civil War histories and so on and mm -hmm. one day, he bought home from the library a uh, new book by Robert Heinlein that uh, he said that uh, uh, the librarian had recommended to him the, uh, they had just got this. And uh, um, so uh, uh, she told him that uh, he might be interested. Heinlein at that time had had a couple of stories published in the uh, Saturday evening uh, post mm -hmm. and uh, so my father uh, got this book it was uh, Heinlein's uh, sixth column and uh, he brought it home and he decided that he didn't really like science fiction but be <clears throat> Before he returned it, I had read it and I loved the book. Yeah. So I read everything that I could get from the library uh, that was science fiction. And uh, uh, since then, I was uh, um, a, a, a solid science fiction fan. Uh, during my uh, uh, teenage years, I uh, 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 read the uh, science fiction that was at the uh, corner drugstore of the magazines and the uh, paperback novels and uh, the school had uh, gotten a uh, uh, arrangement with uh, Battle of Time Books uh, which uh, um, uh, there was approved by the school as a good literature and the Valentine published uh, several science fiction novels by uh, Frederick uh, Pohl and uh, Sir Cornbluth and uh, Arthur Clarke and so on. So I read all those. And uh, I, I read, uh, um, uh, oh, oh, okay. Um, uh, I, um, um, so I was reading science fiction all during the 1950s. And uh, around uh, 19, early 1958 uh, and so on, uh, the uh, uh, a magazine said that the world science fiction that year was going to be in Los Angeles. Uh, so um, uh, by that time I was 17 years old, so I got permission for my parents to attend it. And uh, so I went to that and uh, um, I will say that I really discovered science fiction fandom at that time because I, I spent all my money in the dealers room on youth science fiction magazines and uh, mm -hmm. I could not even afford to go the, to the convention more than for the first day. Um, I, I took the streetcar for my home, uh, but I didn't really care because I had enough old magazines to read for the next six months. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until I was in uh, college, uh, I went to UCLA, and it was in my uh, sophomore year in 1960, when I attended the first meetings of the uh, Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society. And uh, 
um, science fiction fan Rob and I hit it off perfectly. It was wonderful. Uh, the last one met uh, once a week on Thursday evening, so I was a regular attendee uh, for um, since uh, from uh, 1960 on until I had my stroke, mm-hmm. and uh, I started publishing my own mimeograph magazines, uh, uh, fanzines, about uh, 1962. And uh, my first published book review was of, of a furry book, uh, a little, <coughs> little Fuzzy by H.B. Piper, mm-hmm. which I, uh, wait a minute, my, my sister I'm, was, I'm was waving to me. Pause. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fine. She gets things. I should pause to give you a chance to talk. That's that's absolutely fine. Uh, Which is, that's that's a lot of rich information, and I mean, we, yo, it's 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 very very appreciative that that we are able to hear that. So, um, uh, in in that sort of sense, I mean, what what would be the the one thing that intrigues you the most about the furry fandom? Um. That it uh, shows a different way of looking at uh, people um, through the eyes of animals and so on. Um, I guess I didn't realize that consciously at the time, but I was always more interested in the uh, sort of uh, exotic science fiction, the ones that had. Uh, uh, strong alien characters or that uh, showed uh, animal characters. And uh, I didn't realize at the time that the little fuzzy was going to be so important to me, but uh, uh, I liked the character uh, very much indeed. And um, a lot of the uh, science fiction that I read that uh, I particularly uh, remembered and I uh, looked forward to was the uh, um, animal fantasies or science fiction, like uh, Animal Farm by uh, uh, George Orwell and uh, Sirius by Olaf Stapleton, and uh, <coughs> um, at the time they were just they just seemed like uh, very good science fiction books or science fiction books they uh, particularly appreciated. And um, a lot of the uh, science fiction fans I talked with were also uh, interested in the movies on the television program. And I remember that uh, one of the ones that uh, um, was recommended very highly to me, it's one with Kimball White Lion, uh, which was a... Seemed to be just a children's program with uh, talking animals, but he had some uh, intriguing um, uh, uh, philosophical discussions. Like uh, Kimball was a lion cub, and uh, he wanted, uh, uh, he believed in a uh, peace in the uh, African uh, jungle and so on, that everybody should become a vegetarian. And the other carnivores said, hey, uh, hey, we're willing to be friendly as one, but you're basically asking us to starve to death to, to prove that we're good guys. And uh, we don't, don't think that's fair. And um, I realized that this was a valid argument. And uh, uh, I later became a... a uh, MLA fan, and uh, when I w- uh, met uh, Dr. Tesca, who created Kimball the White Lion, he admitted that, uh, yeah, he had basically uh, uh, cheated when he uh, uh, wrote that question because he didn't have an answer for it either. <laughs> he had to make up one where uh, a scientist visiting the jungle uh, conveniently uh, entered, uh, invents a meat substitute. Okay. Uh, Wow. Okay. That's uh, that. Look, I mean, wow. You, um, I'm not even sure. scratch. Do you know if if or Fred? Do you know if the um, if if uh, I I forget the name almost immediately because I'm terrible at names, but um, is is he still uh, with us at this point or or has he? I could not. Uh, he died in 1989. 
Wow. That's a while ago. Uh, very, very unfortunate from the point of the uh, uh, of you of uh, Anime Fandom because he died just when Anime Fandom was getting started. And if he had mm. lived longer, he would almost certainly have been in, invited to many anime conventions in America. Yeah. Mm. I mean, like, uh, obviously with, with that kind of experience or was that, that kind of, yeah, no, definitely with that kind of experience of, of, I guess, both anime culture as well as, I think, people within the anime culture. Uh, do you think that, um, and, and this, is, this, is a, this is off the list, but do you believe that Studio Ghibli did, um, I guess, uh, did, uh, scratch. Well, did what? Um, did justice to that legacy that, that he left, for instance? Um. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, a lot of his, uh, a lot of uh, uh, early uh, Studio Ghibli movies um, were, were uh, headstrong animal uh, characters, yeah. uh, like uh, Totoro and uh, um, um, uh, Porco Rus, who uh, turned into a pig, and uh, so on. So. Um, um, and uh, Pamboko, which was uh, directed by um, Isao Takahata, not by uh, Miyazaki, but uh, uh, those were about uh, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, tanuki, the uh, mm. uh, raccoon dogs. The the the, the so, ones with the with the large. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it was that was that was actually a very good anime. I I. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. I think I possibly cried during it. I'm not sure. Scratch, have you actually watched that anime yet? Dude, <laughs> my default answer to have I watched anything is no. You know how much of an, <laughs> how much of a like visual media leech I am. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Scratch, you want to ask the next question? Um, yeah, I was actually uh, wondering. Uh, you mentioned being in like the sci-fi fandom and the furry fandom and the anime fandom, like. Between them, or between any of the fandoms that you're that you've been involved in, which one has changed the most, either for better or for worse? Because across all these years, stuff must have changed. Um, I, I would say furry fandom definitely, because it started out it was sort of a uh, offshoot of science fiction fandom and. Uh, um, Comics fandom and so on. There was a uh, science, uh, science fiction uh, or fans of the novels like Animal Farm and Water Shop Down and so on, and uh, mm -hmm. comic books like uh, Omaha the Cat Dancer and uh, Teenage Mutant Tur uh, Turtles. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, during the 1990s, all the uh, New uh, furry fans came in who were interested in costuming, and uh, uh, not so much uh, the uh, fans of uh, particular uh, novels or comic books or movies, uh, but uh, they created their their own characters. Mm. And, uh, uh, there's. I don't think there's been anything like that in a science fiction fandom or comics fandom yeah. or a movie fandom. Yeah. Uh, they were all tend to be fans of uh, some professional titles. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th no, I I agree. That's the, always been the one sort of defining thing, the one big characteristic that I think sets the furry fandom apart from most other fandoms it it's very sort of user generated very fan um created content as opposed to just sort of living out in an anime world or something you don't get like oc anime characters you don't see them as as frequently well i, I guess you do get anime characters as ocs but i i would i would argue that they're within the universe that they're sort of created in whereas i think the 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 alternate argument for furries is that we create our characters mm -hmm. to a large extent out of ourselves. Yeah. 
yeah. or, or out of our, I think, needs or wants that we don't necessarily have at that time. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, um, yeah, that was my question. You can go ahead. There are a lot of uh, uh, furry fans that uh, I like a particular book a lot, but I don't think there there's any furry fans that are fans of the book in uh, ter terms of trying to create their own sequels to that book yeah. or uh, stories with those characters. Mm. Um, or they're never solely fans of that one IP, yeah. that one uh, intellectual yeah. property. It's always sort of a package deal. Like you know, That's of, true. Yeah. Mm. And, I mean, and I, I guess that would be maybe a short answer as to why the, the furry fandom is as uh, sometimes difficult to handle, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um because it has so much so much richness to it that a lot of people would feel that um, people steal from others in respect to character design and things like that. I would actually like to ask you. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, obviously there was there was a there was a change in in in, in doing just general animals and then moving towards, I guess, more colorful animals would be the term that we'd like to use. Um, when about did that actually start happening? When people started, like you know, delving into, you know, greens and purples and oranges and and non fur colors. Like, do you, do you, do you have an idea as to when that might have actually started happening? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I would say that it it may have started in the two uh, thousands, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, as I, re I recall, uh, uh, people uh, creating uh, fursuits and so on, they, they were pretty natural uh, um, wolf or cat colors and so on for a, a long time. And it, it took probably at least 10 years for uh, people to start uh, coming up with a neon-colored uh, fur and... Uh, um, a fans of fantasy uh, uh, animal characters uh, like uh, characters. Uh, with characters. wings and so on. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. There's, there's uh, there are a lot of questions here. So, um, uh, what I guess in uh, obviously we've, we've, we've I think we've touched on inspired. We've got we've we've touched on interested. Um, how would you actually describe uh, your career thus far? Um, well, um, I, mean, I guess as far as I'm concerned, the uh, uh, professional part of my career has always been uh, to uh, support me for uh, uh, living in the fandom and so on. I was, I've been a, uh, um, a professional librarian from the time I graduated from UCLA in about 1963 until about uh, 1990. And at that time I went to uh, work for uh, Streamlight Pictures, uh, which was one of the uh, pioneer com companies in America for uh, licensing uh, Japanese animation and uh, distributing it uh, theatrically on, and on home video. Mm -hmm. And I worked for uh, uh, Streamline from 1991 till 2002 when it went out of business. But uh, um, Carl Maslick, the uh, president of Streamline, always gave me lots of time to write my articles, uh, um, mainly on anime because that helped out Streamline's business, but also uh, my articles on uh, furry fandom mm -hmm. uh, all during the uh, 1990s. And uh, uh, Streamline went up a business in uh, 2002, and um, I was uh, a freelance writer for about 
three years, um, I would specialize in wrestling anime because that was where the uh, money was. Uh, uh, so my good things uh, paid me for articles on anime, whereas nobody was paying me for writing about furry fandom. Mm -hmm. And uh, that lasted until 2005 when I had my stroke, and I've been hospitalized ever since. Mm -hmm. right. so, uh, in fact, I was uh, surprised and actually shocked when I uh, got out of the uh, hospital uh, after about a whoops. No worries. Else. Um, uh, uh, okay, for I was in the hospital for about a year, and when I got out of the hospital and tried to reestablish my contacts, I was shocked to find out that uh, some of the uh, biggest anime uh, um, uh, magazines and comic fans things that I've been uh, writing a monthly column for they'd all ceased publication. And one of the biggest anime companies at the time, AV Vision, had uh, uh, gone out of business. And um, so uh, uh, pretty much uh, my anime activities faded away and uh, um, I started concentrating on furry fandom. Mm. And uh, I was in a convalescent hospital at this time, and my um, uh, expenses were covered by Medicare and Medicaid, so I uh, didn't have to worry about uh, earning a living anymore. And uh, so I had lots of time to write about uh, furry fandom. Hmm. Wow. wow. Scratch? Okay. That's making the best of, of a bit of a crappy situation, definitely. Um, Okay. Uh, do you have any tips for um, furs or anyone in um, any of these uh, fandoms, essentially, uh, who would try to want to make a career out of the fandom? Is that possible? Uh, it is possible, but it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, in an anime fandom, there's uh, been a small handful of fans who... Uh, uh, have become professional, uh, either working for a uh, company that is uh, um, translating uh, Japanese animation into uh, uh, English and uh, releasing them on home video. Um, and uh, there were a couple of fans that had moved to Japan for a while uh, to uh, uh, explore uh, 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 some of the titles that they thought would be particularly popular with America, and then they offered their services as uh, consultants to American companies. Uh, one of the best known was Torin Smith, who is dead now, but uh, uh, he, uh, while he was alive, he had made uh, <laughs> Uh, in Japanese animation, he was a professional career. And uh, uh, I'm not sure there's anybody in uh, furry fandom who is doing that because there's just uh, uh, not that many people that are willing to pay uh, furry fans uh, to uh, do things probably up. Uh, Uncle Kagi comes the closest as the uh, uh, permanent chairman of Anthrocon, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know how much money he makes on it, but uh, uh, it's certainly uh, tying up a lot of his time. Mm. No, for sure. Uh, several of the uh, furry artists are making a lot of money accepting commissions. Um, I've been uh, lucky in, in having uh, uh, some of my uh, uh, book covers uh, most recently by uh, um, uh, Ken Cat, uh, uh, Karen Govett, 
and uh, she's um, co been commissioned by uh, uh, my uh, regular publisher uh, for Planet uh, Productions in uh, Dallas. Uh, I don't know how much they're paying her for a cover, but they've bought, bought several covers uh, from her. And uh, she does covers for other people's uh, books and uh, uh, paintings, and um, uh, she's very active. And I think she's making uh, most of her um, uh, professional uh, living from uh, uh, furry art. Mm, that huh. seems to be—it seems to be becoming a much more viable thing these days. I mean, your market is yeah. your market is anywhere in the world with the internet these days. So, yeah, yeah. Actually, and uh, you know what, moving into the uh, internet, we do have a question um, that was forwarded to us by um, Yaku Malan, if I remember you're working with him in respect to the anthology that you're getting together. Um, he, he asks, what was the fandom like before the uh, World Wide Web? Um... It was a paper fandom. There was a lot of correspondence back and forth, and uh, some of the most popular uh, fan scenes were published. Uh, uh, they were mostly mimeographed, uh, and uh, probably the most popular had uh, circulations of 200 or 300 copies, and uh, they were went to uh, most of the... Uh, 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 most active fans, and they got letters of comment, which got published, and so on. So um, there was a, 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 a very, very much a paper. In, in fact, I've uh, sort of said that one reason that I never wrote the history of Furry Fandom that uh, Joe Strike is writing now mm -hmm. is that... Um, uh, when I was originally asked to write a history of furry fandom, I, they, I, uh, uh, I sort of took for a model the uh, uh, histories of the science fiction fandom in the 1930s, uh, which uh, Sam Moskowitz wrote, uh, The Immortal Storm, and Harry Warner Jr. wrote the history of science fiction fandom in the 1940s. Um, uh, and uh, th those took about 10 years each uh, because they had spent uh, time doing very thorough, thorough research. They had uh, uh, written to most of the uh, science fiction fans of the time, and the fans had saved hundreds of fan scenes and all this correspondence and so on. Then they, they could loan it to... Uh, um, Stan Moskowitz and uh, Warner Jr. who write their, their histories. Uh, but when I tried uh, uh, doing research uh, during the 1990s on uh, Freddy Fandom, um, so many people had said that, uh, oh, well, it's all on uh, in the internet these days, and uh, I didn't save it. I can't remember that far back. and. Uh, uh, one of the problems with that uh, uh, in early uh, science fiction fandom in the 1930s and 40s, when fans wrote convention reports, they wrote uh, very detailed reports of seven or eight pages each. And in furry fandom, when fans were writing convention reports, they wrote basically one page of that. I went to the convention, I had a lot of fun, and that was it. There was no details. Mm. Uh, so, in that sense, furry fandom was very difficult, different from uh, science fiction fandom. Hmm. All right. A scratch? Hmm? Do, you, do you have a follow-up, or should I uh, continue? You can continue. Okay. Um, uh, obviously, you guys kept in touch via, uh, I guess, fanzines and everything like that. Um, the... the general question here from Yaku is also the secondary point is what, what challenges and opportunities existed then that don't seem to exist now anymore? Um, very few. 
uh, the sort of goal of most science fiction fans uh, at that time was to become a professional science fiction author. And uh, a few of them made it. Uh, uh, but uh, in general, the, the uh, successful fans, uh, it was a hobby activity for them. Mm -hmm. It remained a hobby activity. Um, uh, whereas in uh, free fandom today, uh, um, most people who want to go to the trouble can become uh, writers or artists or um, even start their own company making fursuits. Mm. Uh, so there is uh, uh, pr uh, money uh, to make me made this way. But a lot of furry fans don't seem to care. They're only, uh, they come to convention to a uh, party. Yeah. Uh, and um, that's about it. Okay. Um, uh, moving on to, I guess, the past, the present, and the future. Um, did you ever think that the fandom would grow to be the way that it is today? Uh, no, I, I thought that Frey Fender would probably uh, remain a uh, small uh, uh, subculture of science fiction fandom, uh, or if people got too much uh, um, interested in uh, uh, the uh, comic books and so on, it might become a uh, um, sub... Um, uh, part of, of comic fandom, but I did not think that it would uh, become a separate fandom of its own and become so prominent uh, as it is today. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd, I'd say thanks very much in part to like Disney and indoctrinating us from a young age in all, in all <laughs> the glory there. Yeah, uh, if if I'm not mistaken, one of your reviews actually speaks about, uh, and it's it's been placed onto Flayra, if I'm not mistaken, your review between the 19 what's it 1960s to the 19 uh, what's 1995 1996 1996 and yeah. yeah, that was uh, uh, produced originally the uh, World Science Fiction Convention, which is going to be in Los Angeles in 1996. So I had. Uh, um, written this uh, sort of outlining chronology of our free fandom from 1966 to 1996 uh, for a uh, uh, handout at the uh, convention. And uh, then I, from there, I uh, uh, had it published in uh, YARF, uh, which was yeah. uh, one of the leading fancies of the time. And uh, um, when uh, Yarf uh, uh, closed down its website and so on, uh, I uh, submitted it to Flavor. I'm mean, still on Flavor. All right. Um, and then to the future, I guess. What do you think the future holds for the fandom? Uh, this uh, this is again from Yaku Milan. Um, in other words, would it, do you think that it will become more uh, mainstream? I guess this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Would it garner the status of religion? Or do you think that it will fizzle out from here? Um, no, I think it will go on pretty much the way that it has been. Um, science fiction fandom goes back to the uh, late 1920s or early 1930s and is larger today than it was, but it's is still basically a, a hobby activity mm. and uh, um, uh, a furry fandom is uh, well uh, since besides an, uh, science fiction fandom there's a comic book fandom which started in the 1960s and I guess you'd say that uh, an animation fandom and anime fandom started about uh, the late 1970s or early 1980s. And furry fandom has started since the uh, 1980s and it's slowly growing and I think it'll continue to grow, but uh, I don't think it'll become much more prominent than it is uh, today in, in the uh, 
um, overall culture will continue to be a hobby like science fiction fandom is a hobby, chess is a hobby, coin collecting is a hobby, and uh, so on. It's, uh, they're different hobbies. Yeah. Yeah, the fur fandom has definitely changed, but um, has it, you know, has it sort of changed for the better over the years? Uh, or mm. is, there, is there something that's been, are there like troublesome elements being introduced in recent days, mm. do you think? There are troublesome elements that are being introduced. Uh, 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 certainly what happened with rainforest is uh, demonstrating that. And um, I think that we have to be careful to uh, um, make sure that furry fandom uh, remains uh, um, in, the, in the control of the people who will control it and not let it uh, uh, go out of uh, um, <laughs> go out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 that that's a fair answer. Now, I mean, obviously, through the years that you've uh, had to adapt to the variety of changes in the fandom itself, how is it that you've managed to maintain your ability to adapt and work with younger groups of furs without feeling as though they might be getting out of hand? Since it, it's almost a follow-up question, I guess. Well, um, to an extent, um, no, while I'm talking to you, I'm looking out the window at squirrels that are jumping. <laughs> Very amazing. But uh, uh, mostly I stay active in the part of free fandom that is uh, uh, devoted to a uh, uh, writing a literature, and that is a more sedate part of fandom than the part who uh, dresses up in fursuits and uh, attends the dances and so on. Yeah. So the, the part that I attend is not that much different from uh, uh, the, um, no, the science fiction fandom that I was used to. Um, I, I guess it's it's more active uh, because uh, uh, as a science fiction fan, I was sort of just a fan. Uh, but uh, with the uh, uh, free fandom and being a uh, active with uh, for planet uh, productions and the uh, furry writers guild and so on, they were the ones who were actually producing the uh, professional uh, books that coming out. And uh, for uh, Dog Patch Press these days, I'm uh, doing these uh, uh, furry book reviews. And uh, I guess I've been doing furry book reviews uh, since uh, 1990. It's uh, hard to imagine that it's been <laughs> over 25 years now, but uh, uh, yeah, I started doing a f uh, furry book reviews as opposed to general science fiction reviews in uh, 1990 for the uh, first issue of uh, YARF, and I've been concentrating on reviewing the science fiction books ever since. Hmm. And Scratch? Hmm. Um. Yeah, uh, this is again from uh, from Yaku Milan. Uh, he says, I love reading your reviews on Dogpatch Press, uh, though my one criticism is that you're very nice, even towards works you obviously don't like. Uh, is this a gesture of goodwill towards fledgling authors, or are you just very non-confrontational uh, reviewing by virtue of your personality? Uh, well, it's partly to uh, avoid becoming hunt confrontational, mm -hmm. and partly because uh, I do recognize that there are uh, many different opinions. Some books that I don't like have fans who like them very much, so I tried to find something good to say about almost everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, from time to time, I do have a killer review of something. <laughs> uh, all right. 
<laughs> Very well said, yes. So, um, I guess moving on to, uh, to an extent, the, the entirety of the WWW, um, the idea of the Patreon model of funding um, for, for creative works, do you believe that that's sustainable or do you think that we're heading towards a saturation point? Um, we are slowly uh, moving to a saturation point. Um, I think that in general, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, Patreon and uh, Kickstarter are, are sort of good ideas. Uh, certainly the uh, more popular and, and more worthwhile uh, projects will get funded, uh, for as, whereas the ones that are not really very good will, will not get that many uh, supporters. Um, but uh, it'll, it'll be better if uh, uh, projects can support themselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I like the. I also like the idea of sort of Kickstarter's Darwinism. Like, if it's, if it's something that people really want, then it will get funded. But then, then again, counterpoint: there was that one potato salad thing. <laughs> yeah. So, Where? Uh, wh how much? How much money was rated, dude, ra raised for? I don't know. For, the guy, for the guy needed ten bucks for potato salad, and then he raised over ten thousand. So he yeah, rented out I, a venue and made like potato salad for everybody. So, <laughs> yeah, it's I, I think it, with that Kickstarter sort of jumped the shark, but I mean it's still going strong and people aren't. It, I don't know. I don't know how, how long it's going to take for it to lose steam, but I do yeah. agree with Fred. There might be some sort of saturation point on the horizon. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Fred, just weird, weird question. Um, obviously, uh, with as as a person who reads quite a lot, you, you uh, the the idea of intertextuality, and the idea of um, books sort of continuing from sort of the seminal works and things like that. Do you think that you've seen that a lot within the furry fandom, where uh, books have actually sort of started almost replying to other works that that had actually begun to come out? Uh, like earlier, say for instance with Watership Down or um, uh, Animal Farm, do you think that people within the furry fandom might actually understand that 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 sort of perspective? Um, actually, yeah, pr uh, probably not. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people. Um, outside of the what you might call the hardcore literary fans, that uh, uh, they 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 write novels and so on, but uh, they're not so much influenced by the, uh, um, the famous novels of the past. Uh, uh, Animal Farm and Watership Down. Uh, have certainly influenced a lot of books. Uh, there's been, uh, uh, I don't know how many that have been as described as uh, the uh, Watership Down with uh, one form of animal or another, Watership Down for mm -hmm. wolves, Watership Down for cats, Watership Down for raccoons, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I haven't seen any uh, d direct imitations. Uh, uh, some books that have been strongly influenced by uh, uh, a classic, but uh, uh, not that many that are out and out copies. Of ah. it. Fair enough. All right. Uh, let me get the questions. One sec. Um, because um, I mean, like, I'm, I'm obviously speaking about things like Duncan Tales and um, uh, what was it? Uh, the yeah. Wolves of Time that came out. Uh, what was it back in the yeah. 1980s? W William Horwood. Yes, books. William Horwood's books, who seem to be very, very influenced by, I guess, the idea of of, of social uh, differences and uh, scratcher. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just. They're uh, all. They're all basically. Uh, humans in, in uh, animal form, and um, 
uh, watership down was sort of unique in that uh, Adams really got into the sort of uh, call it the personality of rabbits. Uh, a lot of these others, like uh, uh, the uh, Dunton books and uh, so on, they were uh, uh, basically humans and animal farm. They had. Uh, didn't get into the uh, personalities of the animals that much. Yeah, no, that's 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 absolutely fair. Uh, Scratch, do you have a a, a question? Uh, um, anything like that? Yeah. yeah, not so much a follow up, but I mean. Uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, moving on. Uh, uh, again, regarding the future, I mean, uh, it it's always yeah for the longest time it has been like books and and, and sort of anthologies and the fanzines that have. Uh, dominated for the longest time, but it's sort of the young upstart on the uh, on the scene is interactive media like um, games and online mm. communities and stuff like that. Um, how do you uh, like? What is the future like for uh, like traditional media uh, with uh, like in the space where interactive entertainment is such a thing? Or do you think uh, media is just going to start gravitating more and more towards the interactive model? I think that it's going to have to involve in other uh, ways because it is sort of using up the the uh, uh, traditional forms and so on. There, there are only so many theme anthologies that uh, um, book editors or publishers can come up with uh, mm -hmm. uh, and we're just about saturated that. So um, people are going to have to uh, come up with something else, and uh, inter interactive media seems to be the way to go. Mm. Um, that's uh, this is something that's sort of leaving me behind because uh, um, uh, I was uh, uh, <laughs> already an adult when uh, the interactive media came about. And I don't really understand a lot of these that are uh, uh, coming on today, or if I do understand them, I'm not really interest that interested in them. But uh, all right, we'll see. I mean, there, uh, I mean, I guess we could, we could probably talk about uh, things like. Um, uh, like a visual visual novels, for instance. I mean, Tempo is bringing out uh, that that visual. I guess you could call it a visual novel, but more of an interactive novel with. Um, Allison and the Amazing Robot Space, uh, Amazing that's, Robot Spaceship Buddy. That's that's correct. And then of course there's um, uh, what's it? A major Minor that came out recently as well, which is obviously nominated for an Ursa Major. Uh, oddly enough, major, minor, major, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, didn't. Um, but yeah, so I mean, visual novels are definitely becoming a thing. I mean, uh, people found, if I'm not mistaken, uh, scratch the the game that came out last year Which with a boy in the with with a boy in the tunnel and Toriel and oh, uh, Undertale, of course. Undertale, of course. I mean, like, uh, so, so these games uh, or visual novels or whichever one you'd like to uh, sort of like speak about are beginning to look at what I would almost consider the way that like the furry fandom is dealing with what one could call existentialism in that there's a choice that one needs to make to either be, be good or bad or be somewhere in between, much like, I mean, uh, novels like... Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and uh, anything by, by by Godot, for instance. I mean, we, we have these people who are out there who are beginning to deal with, with far deeper issues to an extent where they actively involve the reader or the player. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that would be the way to go forward? Um... If not the way, uh, is a way to go forward. Um, there will probably be several different ways, yeah. but uh, it's one that's out there right now. Sorry, I'll be back in a bit. One second. No worries. Carry on. Uh, Fred, you, you, you yeah. can carry on. Oh. Um, 
I'm sure of run out of things to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess the, the follow-up question to that is, is that the future of traditional media, that of books, anthologies, movies, uh, do we think that that would still continue, or do we believe that we would begin to gravitate towards interactive entertainment, such as games, the idea of online communities, the idea of, you know, interactive forums? I know that uh, when when I first joined the fandom in what was it, two thousand and three or four, um, one of the first things that sort of drew me there was a random Yahoo werewolf community where I was able to interact with other players and we would sort of create a, a pack out of that. Um, that is happening and uh, in fact there's also some um, novels that are uh, used that for a plot point. Uh, Chris Nee's uh, um, uh, um, what is it? Uh, uh, 2040 uh, um, uh, how we uh, won the game and so on, mm -hmm. and uh, his uh, the, the characters of his stories are uh, uh, set in these AI controlled uh, universes, uh, which uh, uh, basically let him be uh, him or her be anything that uh, she wants, and uh, so. Those, those are novels um, exploring the form, but there will also be uh, live games uh, uh, like what uh, Second World is it that uh, um, uh, has a lot of those uh, um, sort of. Uh, Pick your, pick your own uh, choice. Uh, yeah. choose, choose your own adventures. Yeah. Right. All right. I mean, and I mean, uh, when it comes to the novels of the 1990s and possibly also the 1980s, I mean, Arl Stein used to be one of the, I guess, biggest names in, I guess, children's books. And I know that I grew up with him. Um, quite extensively in that I was always reading R.L. Stein and eventually sort of moved on to people like uh, Terry Pratchett and on to, um, what was it, Raymond E. Feist and, and everything like that. So, I mean, when it comes to novels and, and the way that we, I, I guess, grow up through that, do we think that, that I guess, our current generation of furries within sort of the ages of, say, 10 to 16 have that same kind of ability to bring that purpose to their life, for instance? Do you think that that's, that's a thing? Um, yes. Uh, uh, maybe not quite as much as it was uh, because there have been so many in the past uh, but for that age group, 10 to 16, everything is sort of new at the time. So they're, they're discovering things that are uh, very revolutionary to them. Even if uh, there have been several others like it before. Um, speaking as somebody who reads a lot of books, yeah. I'm sort of uh, surprised uh, by the... Uh, number of original electronic books, Kindle books, and uh, other books uh, just in the uh, present decade. Uh, uh, be, uh, it used to be the electronic book was a reprint of a uh, paper book, and uh, now there's more and more original uh, Kindle books that are not trying to uh, publish any uh, paper editions. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently a lot of people are uh, making uh, quite a bit of money that way just on uh, the Kimmel books. Hmm. And, I mean, I, I guess speaking about literature and speaking about, um, you know, things that have come out, what, what exactly inspired you, I guess, to uh, sort of conceive with a group of people the, the idea of the Ursa Majors? Well, um, well, I, I was sort of uh, 
very much in favor of those all during the 1970s. I was quite frankly so, uh, um, uh, coming off the uh, science fiction awards and all the awards in uh, comic stuff and so on. And uh, during the 1990s, I said that uh, hey, uh, free fandom is something that's not in science fiction fandom or uh, comics fandom. It ought to have its own awards. And everybody said, yeah, yeah, Fred, if you feel that strongly about it, why don't you do something about it yourself? So I finally did. I uh, um, got... Uh, uh, the uh, conference group which was uh, controlled by Daryl Eckstein at the time, uh, and I proposed uh, the uh, um, what became the uh, Ursa Major Awards to him at the time. He said, yeah, well, um, let's support that if you'll make it a, a real a part of the uh, conference every year. And right. uh, so we did for the first couple of years and it wasn't and it just took us about two years to discover that that was basically a bad idea because everybody thought that the Ursa Major Awards were conference awards only rather than for general fandom so um, we cut it loose from uh, the conference and I uh, started moving up to a different convention every year uh, that's when the uh, um, anthropomorphic literature and arts association uh, uh, became an independent group to administer the uh, Ursa Major Awards. All right. Are are you still heavily involved with the Ursa Majors? Uh, oh. I know that it's it's become like a, a, a sort of an open vote to absolutely everyone, and I know that uh, one of the things that I think maybe. Uh, I guess the people from outside of America, because I know that you mentioned that in an email that you sent to us, uh, would be sort of happy to hear is, is that we can begin to, I guess, not even begin to, but um, nominate things from outside of America to actually sort of act as part of that, and people would be able to, to the, take the part. Earth, Earth's a major award have always been intended to be an international award and uh, we, one of the things that sort of frustrates us is that so many people think that it's just for American uh, for li literature alone uh, so we would very much like to get uh, uh, other nations involved in it. We think that we might be able to, might be doing this with uh, some Australian books, uh, but uh, there's not that much Australian stuff that's coming out. There's one Australian press, Jaffa Books, yeah. uh, but uh, hopefully there'll be more. We um, we actually had an interview with Jaffa Books recently, and uh, oddly enough, when you mentioned Howell, uh, the Sunday previously to the point that you actually mentioned uh, Howell Publishing, we um, <laughs> had an interview with them as well, and it's kind of what, what sort of led us to, uh, I, I guess, uh, organize this, this one as well, specifically because, I mean, um, he speaks very, very highly of you. As, as a person who who knows his literature, who knows sort of what is necessary uh, to be able to, I guess, break it into in, into the the, the, the the both science fiction, um, fantasy, anime sort of perspective. I mean, your uh, your record stands for you, I believe. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. Um, I've been a big fan of science fiction. I've read all that I can find. But you also have to have um, uh, read more widely than just the science fiction. Uh, yeah. A lot of the uh, class era classic uh, literary giants like Alexander Dumas and uh, mm. F. Scott Fitzgerald and so on that uh, uh, never have written that much in furry fandom. The uh, they're still very, very much worth reading. Yeah. But uh, I remember that, that one of the things that 
surprised me when I read The Three Musketeers by Alexander Duma. If you've seen any of the uh, movies, they're all about the uh, sort of heroic musketeers fighting the evil cardinal guards and so on. Uh, if you read the novel, that's what the characters say, but the novel makes it clear that they're both just gangs of teenage bullies that are swaggering about uh, yeah. be, um, uh, beating people with their swords. It's 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 almost exactly like I mean if you if you think about something like that it's like Romeo and Juliet um, in in almost this the same kind of almost absurdity as soon as you start realizing that these are a whole bunch of fourteen year olds yeah. having a massive fight with one another about a love interest. <laughs> And it's 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 amazing that that I mean literature has come very very far. I mean we we can't deny that I don't think. And I I personally believe that the the the, the furry fandom is only adding very very rich um, information and 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 novels to the to the, the the growing literary sort of movement. And I think that it's yeah. it's important that we acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I mean, in 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 saying that, I mean, much like I guess the 1960s, um, the idea of what one could call uh, scratch, maybe just help me out here. When when somebody writes a book or a story or a short story based on somebody else's characters, um, uh, tribute stories? No, not tribute stories. Um, where they ship people together for no apparent oh, fan reason. Fiction. Fan fictions. What is what is your opinion on fan fictions? Um, it's a great way to uh, uh, develop experience. Uh, some of the uh, um, uh, science fiction writers of the last twenty uh, years or so got their starts in writing the Star Trek uh, fan fiction, and. Uh, um, certainly, there was a fan in uh, uh, the Los Angeles Science Fantasy Society in the late 1960s and so on. He was a fan of the man from Uncle uh, uh, television show and the uh, paperback novels, and he wrote some man from Uncle fan fictions and uh, published them in fanzine forms and sent them to uh, Ace Books, which was publishing the uh, authorized man from Uncle Paperbacks. So the editor said, you're too good a writer to waste your time with all this fan fiction. Now why don't you write some uh, professional stories? Okay. So um, I think uh, some of the... Uh, uh, furry fans of uh, the Lion King and, and uh, uh, so on, Zootopia, uh, who are writing uh, fan fiction, uh, where are getting some experience that uh, they can uh, use to uh, hopefully become professional writers. Okay. Uh, and I mean, like. Uh... All you need is a start. I know that uh, we, we spoke to Tempo before. We've spoken to uh, Carl Gold as well. And one of the sort of like maintaining themes that we've always read or seen or heard is that everybody has a story within them. Any, any kind of story is at, at some point just good enough to be able to, pub to be published. Um, do you sort of hold to that kind of idea? Uh... I guess not, because I've seen some people that try to become um, uh, professional authors and they have nothing original to say. It's all their stuff is embarrassingly derivative. But uh, most people uh, uh, do try to have uh, uh, something uh, uh, different to say or at least uh, express it a bit di differently and so on. So uh, they uh, um, have at least one good story. Uh. Okay. Scratch? Um, I, to be honest, I'm a little bit sort of blank here. 
Uh, can't really think of anything I, I can. I, I. I. do actually want to ask a quick question. When it came to Kyle Gold, for instance, I mean, uh, back in the early, I think it was the 2010s, um, late 2009, around about there, 2008, 2009, he'd begun winning a large amount of accolades from the Ursa Majors, and obviously he pulled out. Well, what do you think was the general reaction from the people who were part of the awards themselves? Like when, if, if somebody is considering possibly just pulling away to allow other writers or other artists or other podcasters or anything like that to actually begin to gain accolades that they've just been getting because of their fame, um, do you feel that, that that was a fair move from, say, people like him? Um, this is something that there's been a lot of debate about. Um, I, I personally am, am sort of uh, uh, against it uh, because, well, certainly from the point of view of the Ursula Major, they were a popular vote award. I think people should be able to vote for whatever they think is the best and uh, rather than have uh, uh, what they want to vote for withdrawn from my uh, consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are others that are, agree very much with that point of view. They say that Kyle Gold has won so many wars he doesn't need to win them every year and let somebody else have a chance. Mm. So it's... it's uh, very much uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Because, I mean, like, uh, somebody like Rukas, for instance, possibly wouldn't have been as, as well known um, had it not been for Carl Gold sort of pulling away just for, for half a second. I mean, let's, let's, yeah. not, let's, let's not, not talk about the idea that the Ursa Majors are, in fact, a almost, what, what would you call it, a uh, measuring stick a litmus paper for, um, I guess, people getting out there. Yeah. Um, well, the Ursula Majors and, and the Cardiola Awards, you yes. know, that uh, uh, people can sort of uh, dominate them for quite a while. Uh, Rukas was well known as a uh, artist, and now she's uh, proven that she can write as well. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. I think that this is uh, to the better. Okay. Uh, I hope that uh, more people will do this. Yeah, fair. Uh, one of the questions that I would actually like to ask possibly is um, if we look at, say, best anthropomorphic dramatic short works or series, for instance, I mean, uh, something like BoJack Horseman was, I guess, sorely missed from the uh, from from who was nominated in there and who came like up to from first to, uh, for, from first to fifth. And I mean, granted, yes, it's an American series, and that My Little Pony continually seems to win since nineteen uh, nineteen fifteen, since twenty fifteen, twenty fourteen, twenty thirteen. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, is, is there a possibility that the, that the Ursa Majors would at some point maybe on their own right take something like that away to allow for other different uh, points to move forward? Uh, that's been discussed, but uh, not very much. Uh, in general, the feeling is that uh, uh, it's up to the... Uh, writer or the uh, program itself uh, to declare whether it uh, uh, should uh, uh, no longer be a uh, contender. Mm. Uh, probably the closest that, that's ever gotten was uh, when uh, Stan Sakai's Usagi Ojimbo was uh, winning uh, uh, so many uh, uh, awards uh, uh, that uh, uh, the suggestion was made that we uh, disqualify that from uh, uh, nominations in the future. Mm. But uh, it sort of stopped winning, uh, winning wars on its own. Because, so. I mean, we've, we've, we've spoken to uh, Rick Griffin 
Biden, actually, uh, not too long ago. We asked him almost the same question, whether he would actually, at some point, you know, pull a Kyle Gold, um, in that he would say, pull away and say, go, well, well, let's see who else would possibly be the nearest contender for anthropomorphic com comic strip. Yeah. And um, he vehemently, uh, not necessarily vehemently, but he very strongly said that if you think that you can beat me, try. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> but not in a cocky way, more just like, yeah. like right. by all means, I invite, uh, I invite challenge, I invite competition. Mm. So, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's possibly the, uh, the, 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 the dichotomy of ideas that we have here, where it's, if, uh, it, it's something along the lines of that. But, I mean, in that, same se in, the, in that same sense, do we ever ask, say, James Tyson and James Wooten whether they'd like to pull out of the Ursa Major Awards to ensure that other people might actually get Best Anthropomorphic Dramatic Series or uh, Short Work? Uh -huh. <clears throat> it's it, it's a genuine question, I think. Um, yeah. it's, it's something that we might have to look at to, because I mean, again, My Little Pony was not necessarily ever, uh, I guess, meant for furries, or was it? Or how how do you feel about it? Was, it was meant professionally for uh, merchandising for uh, for girls, mm. uh, but uh, the uh, people who were uh, uh, creating the program sort of uh, um, put some depth into it, in, into it, its, its plots and its characters and so on, and uh, that's what made it uh, famous, uh, popular, so popular. Mm. And, uh, sure. yeah. uh, there are several uh, writers that have uh, written a lot of uh, Michael Pony fan fiction, and uh, uh, Michael Payne has uh, been uh, very adept at, uh, he writes it as uh, My Little Pony fan fiction, and then he sort of changes the name to make them uh, original and uh, publish them as original novels. You can tell what they're based on, but they're um, it's still original novels. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, hmm. Scratch, do you have any other questions that you might want to ask? Um, well, the, uh, sort of the My Little Pony one was rearing its head in, uh, for me as well, but you covered it well enough. Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, and uh, I guess, like, I, a lot of people know you through the, the, the Ursa Major Awards. Um, I think that uh, anybody who, who clicks past just the Ursa Major Awards and looks at, say, contacts and links, which is, I guess, one, one of the things that we did when we, when we attempted to find you. And, I mean, one of the other things that I also found was that, uh, oh, yes, actually, that's a good question. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to change tack for, like, two seconds. Your... Um, your work with, I think it is, is it um, one of the universities of Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken, Berkeley? Uh, 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 probably you mean Riverside, yes. uh, University of California, Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, was the, what was the thought behind that? Because, I mean, you've been helping them for years, possibly even more than decades. Um, on how to uh, actively sort of get the kind of novels, um, you know, uh, sorted out within both science fiction, within um, all the fandoms that you're sort of connected with. How, how difficult is that? Um, well, for me, it wasn't uh, that difficult at all. Um, it was started by... A uh, professor there, uh, uh, George Lloyd Eaton, who collected science fiction, and he gave uh, his uh, library uh, to the uh, his personal library to the library at uh, UC Riverside, and uh, um, he they they tried to promote UC Riverside for 
uh, science fiction collections, and they got a lot of support from within the LA Science Fantasy Society. Uh, one of the uh, uh, leading uh, fans in the club was Bruce Pels, and another was Rick Sneary, and they uh, donated uh, their, uh, or they left it in their wills that uh, when they died, their collections were donated to the uh, um, uh, 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 UCLA Riverside. So when I had my stroke in 2005, um, I'd, I'd been collecting science fiction all my life. And uh, so I had uh, over 50 years of uh, um, uh, books and uh, fan scenes and uh, um, other stuff. Uh, I mean, it had, I had an apartment in Culver City at the time that's just stacked up in the apartment. And uh, when I had my stroke, uh, the uh, my landlord said, "Well, I'm going to throw everything in the dumpster because I, uh, you, you can't pay the uh, rent on the apartment anymore, and I'm going to have to get a new uh, uh, tenant." And um, uh, uh, so we 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 uh, um, agreed that uh, he gave me time to. Uh, I, um, the, uh, several of the fans from the uh, LA Science Fanzines, uh, I, they came out and packed up my books, and uh, uh, we already had this relationship with I uh, used the Riverside, so I donated my collection there, and um, it was almost 900 boxes. Yes. And uh, s since then, uh, my <laughs> sister has taken me out to uh, the uh, um, uh, library several times. It's about a 75-mile trip away for uh, it's uh, there and back is a pretty solid one-day trip for me. Yeah. And I've been uh, video interviewed uh, by them on uh, science fiction and uh, I, I've sort of helped them out, and they've helped me out, and uh, so um, I, I still recommend the uh, uh, UC Riverside very much if, if you've got a big collection of stuff in, uh, in free fandom, there's uh, certainly a lot. Uh, think about uh, uh, leaving it in your will to... Uh, uh, use the world aside if you don't make uh, contra uh, contributions out of your life. I know one of the th things that they would like to get for their uh, furry collection is uh, some examples of fursuits. Mm. Uh, they they have very little because most uh, fans who wear, wear fursuits uh, wear them until they're worn out. And they sort of recycle the uh, materials into other fursuits. Uh, but uh, certainly a library that uh, is, uh, um, hopes they have a big collection of uh, furry materials needs some fursuits. Mm. No, that's absolutely true. I, uh, wow, I mean, like, um, we'll definitely put a call out for that. Um, uh, in the future, I think. Uh, possibly, actually, uh, I, I obviously run the radio show afterwards as well, so I'll definitely put a, fo a call out for people who are willing to um, donate uh, retired fursuits and things like that towards uh, that, that specific cause. But I think, because I, I, I actually also agree with the idea of having, you know, some, some, of, some, some sort of record that, you know, if for instance, the fandom, I guess, destroys itself in its yeah. own way, that there's some record that it existed. Um, yeah. And I, I, that, that was one of the things that my book on Furry Fandom Convention was yeah. supposed to do. I was uh, very glad to get a book out that was not by one of the uh, uh, furry specialty presses. It was by a... Uh, uh, general uh, academic publisher, hmm. and I hope there'll be more like that. Speaking of, there was obviously a video or a, 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 a documentary recently um, 
created, I think it was with the help of a Sky and uh, it was, I think it was independent, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, and it, it was very, I, I would believe, um, I haven't actually seen it myself yet, and I do think that I should definitely possibly spend some time over this weekend to actively watch it, um, where people actually spoke about the, the, the fandom itself from um, what I would only consider to be a very uh, objective perspective. Uh, this is furries and inside look. Um, a lifestyle, a fan-made documentary. Have you actually seen it yet? Uh, no, I have not. No. Okay, all right. Um, I, I guess that, that means we've all got homework. Yeah, no I have. So. Yeah, I, I do need to watch this because it, it it I remember I read a review on it and the person seemed very very sort of nonplussed about the entire idea that the fandom uh, has the kind of troubles that it does um, because we're we're supposedly one of the most accepting fandoms in I guess in out ever. of all of <laughs> in ever yeah I'm not sure if you would agree with that or not um, I know that we've shown a little bit more. Uh, what would it be? Tolerance, lenience. I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of that. We've become almost a separate liberalist view, which isn't necessarily always a good thing, um, of, of, of people and, I, and, and groups I think, around us. Uh, yeah? What happened with uh, uh, Rainforest is uh, that it's a bad thing to be too inviting uh, to. Uh, um, anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 neither myself nor nor Scratch actually, and I'm sure that um, in some of our younger audience uh, might not necessarily know about exactly what happened there. Is is there a possibility that you might be able to give us uh, a bit of background? Uh, yeah, uh, Rainforest was uh, a. Uh, a uh, popular uh, furry convention in uh, Seattle for about uh, 10 years, from about 2007 or 2008 until 2015. And it got up to about 25 or 2,600 uh, attendees. Mm. And uh, the uh, final year, um, it... it was criticized uh, sort of even before it started for uh, uh, sort of uh, turning its back on a lot of the uh, veteran fans and uh, trying for a youth culture uh, um, uh, personality. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got a couple of uh, uh, vandals who uh, basically tried to the hotel so badly in the, the the hotel canceled the contract oh. and uh, said that uh, Rainforest was no longer uh, uh, welcome there and they uh, put out such uh, a, um, a bad word in the end of the story that Rainforest could not get any other hotel uh, either and uh, uh, the uh, convention has just been uh, permanently canceled uh, despite its uh, um, a success for 10 years uh, because uh, uh, they can't get a uh, um, uh, the hotel anymore and uh, this this was partly considered the uh, Rainforest uh, Committee's uh, fault for not policing itself uh, more thoroughly. Okay. Huh. Um... Do you think that that might be something that would happen over the next couple of years, that people who are spurned, who believe that, I guess, the new movement within, I guess, social societies, um, where this idea of, I have a voice, therefore I can actually speak my mind about things, um, is, is, is that something that might actually change, change the way that we look at specific ideas and ideologies? Um, no, that that's doubtful. Um, I think that uh, 
um, as, a, as a result of what happened to Rainforest, uh, a lot of the uh, furry convention committees are uh, uh, keeping a sharp eye out on uh, what goes on. And uh, I think that if individual fans try to cause trouble, as long as the convention committee uh, tries uh, to prevent it, the hotels uh, uh, will give the committees uh, some slack. The uh, uh, main reason the uh, hotel was uh, opposed to uh, Rainforest with uh, got the impression that the Rainforest committee said, uh, uh, well, we're not really responsible for what a few troublemakers do. And uh, they just let the troublemakers uh, um, do what they wanted to. Hmm. But uh, so I, I don't think that's going to happen again. Okay. Uh, Scratch, do you have anything that you'd like to ask? Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. Um, I can't really think of anything right now. I mean, the the convention scene is yeah. We've we've sort of covered that. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure right now. To be to be dead honest, I think. All right. <laughs> I think I'm tapped out. <laughs> I mean, I've I've run out of questions about like 30 minutes ago, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, well, actually, let's 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 ask this question. How do you see the fandom 50 years from now? Oh boy. Oh boy. Um. <laughs> Well, it's going to, in a sense, it's going to uh, continue to be a, uh, a minority in the, in the general society. Uh, the whole um, civilization will probably be so much uh, uh, so different in 50 years from now that it's hard to tell. Um, but... Um, um, I imagine that uh, uh, within its own small world, our free family will continue to uh, go along. Huh. All right. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's definitely something, I guess, a little bit more uh, pe uh, optimistic mm. for, for our fandom, I believe. And I think that that's, that's, that's some good words to end off with and we really 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 enjoyed having you on here by the way it was this yeah. has been yeah, no, it's been an I absolute honor it's been an absolute honor yeah okay. i think and and if anything um we'll, pro we'll probably stay in contact uh okay. just in case we do want to give you uh, i I'm, I'm sure that there are going to be more questions following up after this okay. And uh, I, I will look forward to seeing this podcast when it gets edited and uh, uh, put on the air. Mm. We, we, we don't do much editing. Edited. Yeah. <laughs> edited in, in massive air quotes. Uh, air quotes, yeah. We, we tend to put this up as it is, and I think that that's, 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 the, that's the most honest that we can get. Um, okay. In that, and and we enjoy a good, honest conversation. I think that we there are definitely a lot more conversations that we could have, and we really hope to hear from you again soon. And uh, we really look forward to anything that you'll be bringing out. Uh, speaking of which, uh, projects that you're working on, anything that you'd like to uh, let people know about? Well, I've got. Um, um, <laughs> at least two more books coming out this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Symbol of Nation from uh, Gold Publications in uh, June and uh, Dogs of War II uh, in uh, d December at uh, uh, Midwest Fur Fest. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, Thurston Howe Publications has asked me to uh, um, edit some anthologies of uh, for humor for them. Uh, the uh, uh, they'll probably be out next year. Awesome. And uh, I have another uh, uh, serious for a literary book that I would like to get 
uh, McFarland interested in, but uh, uh, the they they haven't replied yet. They're still uh, studying the sales figures on uh, for fandom conventions. If uh, that hasn't sold well enough, they will not be interested in, in another book. So I, I hope that furry fan conventions will sell. Mm. All right. Uh, um, Scratch, I think there, there might actually be one last question. Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, what, would, what, what would you like your legacy to be? I mean, we all try to leave something behind and leave a mark on the world, but... What would you What would you like that to be for you? I've I've got uh, a dozen books out, and uh, I've been uh, uh, running furry book reviews uh, ever since 1990, and uh, Dogpatch Press has uh, uh, a lot of them. So uh, I guess uh, my legacy will be a early. Uh, uh, furry author, uh, uh, book reviewer, and creator of the uh, Ursa Major Awards. Hmm. All right. Well, again, thank you very, very much for for having this interview with us. We, uh, I, I personally feel that it's it's been an absolute ple pleasure having you on here. It's it's I uh, I can't even put it into words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's been amazing having you, and I really really appreciate that you uh, took some time out for us as well. Um, uh, all right. Well, I, I would like to uh, thank my sister who allowed me to use her apartment to have this uh, uh, interview in. Uh, it's certainly a lot quieter than uh, my convalescent and the hospital is. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm in a big. Um, uh, um, Three bedroom with two other patients who watch the television at uh, a loud volume all the time, so it would not be possible to have an interview there. All right. Well, we we really hope to hear from you uh, anytime soon, and we're very very happy to have ha uh, to have had you on um, our podcast. And again, we wish you all the best going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and I think with that, we're going to sign off for the evening, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Have a good night. Goodbye. Good night. Good night.